Hello there, I'm Black Bright, broadcasting out of the UK. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, depending on which part of the world you're watching this video from. Um, if it's the first time you're visiting my channel, please subscribe, like and share. And um, yeah, I tend to talk about a lot of different to to topics more recently because of all these deportations going on. I've been doing a lot about that. And this evening, I thought I would let those of you who are interested to know about the technicalities of deportation. Now, I'm going to have to read it because I don't want to get it wrong, but I thought it's interesting and I think it will help a lot of you understand um, the mechanics of deportation. I've got it from a very credible source. I'm going to put the link in the description below it is called the right to remain org i think but yeah i found it absolutely incredible the information on there is absolutely essential for anybody you know who is being deported or who is in detention it tells you how to challenge detention it tells you how to get in touch with your mp it's got everything in there so, um, yes, yeah. so I'm just going to read, um, read this out. So it might be a bit boring, but hopefully it's informative. So forced removal, sometimes called administrative removal, is when the Home Office enforces your removal from the UK if you don't have any leave to remain. If your application for leave to remain, including an asylum claim, has been refused, or you did have some form of leave to remain, a visa, but it has now expired. So in that situation, it's not meant to be a deportation. You're not supposed to be on these charter flights and be deported if it's linked with your visa application. You are supposed to be removed, which is a much more dignified way of being repatriated. Uh, deportation, legally speaking, in the UK is the enforced removal of someone for the public good, usually after serving a criminal sentence in the UK. And that's what we've been seeing. As long as you've served a criminal sentence, I thought it had to be about four years, but it can be any time over 12 months. So I only found that out today from reading this. Um, removals and deportations are usually carried out either on a commercial airline, one person being removed, deported, usually escorted by security guards, and the other passengers are the public travelling for holiday or business, or by private charter flight. Usually, lots of people being removed, deported, bleak deported, to the same country at the same time. So you don't really see them on um, with other passengers, though. They normally book those charter flights. And to be honest, like after I've watched all those, um, read all of those articles about how they abuse them when they're on the flights, I'm not surprised why they put them on a charter flight where they can do whatever they want with them. And there's no supervision. There's no one they can call for help. They're in the air for eight hours, eight to ten hours, being disrespected, abused and humiliated. That really makes my blood boil. Removals. You are, asked, you are at a risk of removal if you do not have any leave to remain in the UK and, have, and haven't applied for any. If your asylum or immigration application is refused or your leave, you, or the leave you had has expired. That's kind of a repetition. Since 2015, the Home Office has been able to inform someone they are liable to removal and then remove that person at any given point during a three-month removal window. This is a change to the former legal obligation of issuing removal directions, which would specify the date, time and flight number of the removal. So before they would give you the date, 
the flight number so at least you could let your family know and on the other side you could be received or at least they know that you're coming but they don't do that anymore although the home office may still in some cases issue courtesy letters containing this information there is no legal obligation to do so apart from those cases where the removal window cannot be used the Home Office must give you notice that you are liable to be to removal and cannot lawfully remove you during this notice period. During this notice period, you may be able to legally challenge the removal. Once that notice period is over, the three-month removal window begins and you can be removed without notice at any point during it. The removal window can be extended by 28 days. If removal doesn't take place, for example, because of a delay in receiving a travel document or booking escorts and where the Home Office expects to be able to remove you within those additional 28 days. The general notice period is seven calendar days if you are not detained or just 72 hours if you are detained. The 72 hours must include at least two working days. Removal, oblique deportation. 24 hours must include a working day unless the notice period already includes the three working days. Cases where removal windows can't be used. There are certain situations where Home Office policy is that removal windows should not be used in these circumstances. Removal directions will be issued. A removal window should not be used in family cases. People with independent evidence, meaning other than self-declaration, that they are an adult at risk in terms of detention policy should not be subject to a removal window. Adult at risk. I wonder if that's somebody, if they're at risk to themselves or if they're at risk to the country. Not quite sure. Removal windows should not be used in Dublin, third country cases, or in cases certified as clearly unfounded. That's no... That's non-suspensive appeal cases, whatever that means. Um, in cases of charter flight removals, the notice period is five working days. The standard notice periods do not apply in port cases, for example, non-asylum applications, where a visa may have been applied for, but entry to the UK is refused. In these cases, if removal is to take place within seven days of refusal to enter, the Home Office does not need to give 72 hours notice. If a non-suspensive appeal case has already been challenged unsuccessfully by judicial review, the Home Office only needs to give 72 hours notice of removal challenging the removal. You should not be removed from the UK if you have an asylum case pending unless it has been decided the UK is not responsible for your asylum claim under the Dublin regulations. I'm not quite sure what that is. You should not be removed from the UK if you have an appeal pending in the UK or you have a hearing coming up or if you have had a hearing but the decision has not been made. So as long as you've got an appeal or something pending, they, you should not be removed from the country. And remember, not everyone has the right to appeal in the UK. I didn't know that. I thought everybody had the right to appeal, but apparently not. Well, I guess if you're a terrorist or something like that, you're not going to have the right to appeal. OK, you should not be removed from the UK if you have submitted a fresh claim and a decision has not yet been made on whether it is a fresh claim or not. You should keep proof of submitting a fresh claim. You should not be removed from the UK if you have an injunction preventing that removal. 
Home Office guidance brought in November 2016 states that if judicial review proceedings are brought within the three month removal window, this will not be enough to suspend the removal and an injunction will be required. You should not be removed from the UK if it would breach the UK's obligations under the Refugee Convention or the European Convention on Human Rights or EEA Treaty Rights. I'm not sure how that will work once um, we transition from Brexit. There may be other reasons you can challenge your removal, such as if other legal proceedings are ongoing in other areas of law, e.g. family law, or if the proper procedure for removal has not been followed. And this is what most of those protesters fall under, this area here. You cannot be removed if the proper procedure for removal has not been followed. And if you can prove that, you should not be removed. Okay. You may also be able to ask for a removal to be deferred. For example, if you do not have a legal representative, if your legal representatives have changed during the removal window, or if you are detained and have not been able to access the legal aid surgery in time. So you can ask for a deference. You know, sometimes, you know, like in those five days that they gave those um, de deportees um, time when they didn't have the SIM card and they were given five days. Now, if your legal representative has changed hands or if you can't get hold of them, um, you are allowed to ask for a deferral. I think, I don't think many people know that. Okay, deportation after a criminal offence, because we have different um, reasons for deportation. So this one is deportation after a criminal offence. If a deportation order has been made against you, you will be issued with notice of deportation arrangements. And this should be in keeping with the removal notice periods above. To prevent your deportation you need to prove that it would breach your rights under the Refugee Convention of the Human Rights Convention. That's why you need an immigration lawyer. Like I said, you make sure they're OISC approved. You can get them from www.gov.uk. The Home Office has a list of registered um, solicitors or lawyers, immigration lawyers, and so does the Citizens Advice Bureau. Make sure that they're registered because they have an obligation to provide a certain service. Okay, they're not just going to take your money and run or to give, you know, build up your hopes when they can't do anything. Within a couple of minutes, when they say, can I have free advice, you know, we offer free advice, they can determine in a couple of minutes whether you're worth their time. They're not going to take you on if you're not worth their time. First thing they probably say to you, OK, you've done time. How long, how much time did you do in prison? Four years? OK, I don't think there's much we can help you with unless there's some mitigating factors to do with the family. But they'd have to be massive. They'd have to be some serious, serious connections and a lot of people don't have that so you know they do when they say we offer free advice it's only really to gauge whether or not you're worth their time because some of these people they do no no fee um no win no fee they do get a fee but it's done in such a way that they'd have to have confidence that the case that they're taking on is going to win OK, the immigration rules are now weighted very much in favour of deport deporting a person after a criminal sentence. And that should really be straight after the sentence, not 10 years afterwards. The rule states that if you were sentenced for more than 12 months, your deportation is conducive to the public good and in the public interest. The rules also say that your deportation is conducive to the public good and in public interest if your offending caused serious harm as determined by the Home Office or 
if you are a persistent offender. A persistent offender is somebody who's done a crime more than twice. That's what they call a persistent offender. You've done this crime more than twice, you can be deported. Um, who shows a particular disregard for the law. Because the thing is, if you've done something wrong and you've got caught and you've you know, been let off on probation or whatever, and you go again and you get caught again and you're, you know, that, you know, you get a prison sentence of whatever it is, six to 12 months. They consider that disregard for the law because you've already been given a break. You've already done your, you've already been um, penalised for the crime you've committed and you've gone and committed another crime. So that means you don't respect the law. So for that reason, you'll be deported. So if you've got more than one criminal record or you've done time more than once and you're not born in the country, this is what this is saying. You could be deported. Okay, and that is irrespective of how long you were sentenced for. Three months, six months, it doesn't matter. I mean, I had a habit in previous videos of saying, you know, they haven't done four years because it was in the past. If you, you know, you had to have done more than four years in order to be deported. But that's not the case. Any time. If you're a persistent offender, it could be two months, three months, six months. And when I say persistent, like I said, you've done, you've been pulled into um, the police station for two to three times. That's what they call a persistent offender. Okay, if you're liable to deportation, your spouse or civil partner and oblique or your child, if they are under 18, are also liable to be deported unless they have settled status in the UK in their own right or have been living apart from you. So if you've done a crime and they're deporting you and you've married somebody who hasn't got um, settled status or is not a citizen and you all live together prior to your um, imprisonment, your family can be deported as well. So you have some, I, 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 I kind of talk about this story where this man, he married a British woman and he waited eight years before he left her. He made sure he got his citizenship, right? And he waited eight years before he left her and then brought over his Jamaican woman. In that circumstance, if he committed a crime and was eligible for deportation, that woman he brought over from Jamaica would be deported as well. So that is a very good example of how that can happen. You know, and if they've got kids, because the two of them are not born on the soil, neither he, because he got his citizenship through naturalization, and neither she, because he's brought her over from Jamaica, and they've got kids on the soil, but the parents aren't Jamaican, I mean, aren't English, that is a prime um, excuse for deportation. If you're sent sentenced to more than four years, the Home Office guidance says you will need to have very compelling circumstances in order for a deportation order not to be made or to be revoked. Remember, however, that a court may have a different interpretation of what counts as those circumstances than the Home Office. If you have been sentenced for less than four years, but more than 12 months or your offending is deemed to fall into the causing serious harm category described above, the immigration rules say that deportation would be proportionate except if deportation would be in breach of your Article 8 rights to family and private life and 1. If you have a child under the age of 18 in the UK, 
you have a genuine and subsisting parental relationship with your child, and that would need to be proved. You'd need to show that you've been paying money into that child's bank account. You've got receipts for all the clothes, the money that you, all the clothes that you've bought for that child, and you've got um, receipts for anything that you've done with the child, photographs, anything. But you had to have to be seen the, the, with the child. Okay, your child is a British citizen or has lived in the UK for at least seven years immediately prior to the decision to deport you. If it would be unduly harsh for your child to live in the country to which you will deport it and if you would be, uh, it, sorry, and it would be unduly harsh for your child to remain in the UK without you. So these are the arguments you would have to satisfy in order for them to stay your deportation. Or two, you have a genuine and subsisting relationship with a partner who is in the UK and is a British citizen or settled in the UK and, not or, and, the relationship was formed at a time when you were in the UK lawfully and your immigration status was not precarious. And, you see that? So, if you married a British citizen and you'd overstayed, you don't have a chance. You, your, your status in the country when you married that British citizen would have had to have been legal. It would be unduly harsh for your partner to live in the, these are the reasons for um, asking appealing deportation. It would be unduly harsh for your partner to live in the country to which you are being deported because of compelling circumstances over and above very significant difficulties which would be faced by you and your partner in continuing your family life together outside the UK and which could not be overcome or would entail very serious hardship for you and your partner. You can imagine how hard that is to prove. I think that comes under the, Zamb the Zambrano principle, I think. It would be and, not all, and it would be unduly harsh for your partner to remain in the UK without you. You would also need to show that you have been lawfully resident in the UK for most of your life. And you are socially and culturally integrated in the UK. So if that's the case, how come them kick off them, those, those guys that have been in the country since they're children, if that is the case? They could prove that they're socially and culturally integrated in the UK. And there would be very significant obstacles to integration into the country to which you are being deported. Those guys have got a case just based on that. I'm sure most of those guys were lawfully resident. Unless, you know what they do? Oh, the little bastards. You know what they do? It's so premeditated, if I'm getting this right. This says, you will need to show that you have been lawfully resident in the UK for most of your life. Lawfully registered resident. But you know if you do a crime, they reject your application. You can no longer, um, like if you get that indefinitely to a mail, they take it away. And then when you come out of, after doing that crime, you have to apply again. So then that puts you in the unlawful resident, in which case you're exempt from this. Because technically speaking, if they don't um, deny um, the application or indefinite leave to remain or whatever they do when they go in prison, 
they would be able to show they're lawfully resident in the UK for most of their life. And they are socially and culturally integrated in the UK and there would be a significant obstacles to integrating into the country to which you're being deported. That paragraph alone fits those um, returnees to a T. So under that alone, they should not have been deported. The Home Office guidance says that you must provide original, independent and verifiable documentary evidence of all of these factors. And they've got something called C rights of the child section. They've got a toolkit. When you go to this right to remain website, they've got a toolkit. It's got everything you need, everything you need. If anyone you know is on the verge of deportation or they want to be clued up because they may be deported in the future. I suggest you go to that website. Like I said, I'm going to put it to the, to below. If I don't remember when I post it, because sometimes I just click it and it's getting late, I will definitely edit and put it in there. Anyway, remember that the Home Office is likely to take a very restricted view on who meets the circumstances above. A judge in court may not agree. The Home Office cannot dictate in the immigration rules exactly what Article 8 means and what would be a disproportionate breach for every case. A judge may find that even if you don't meet the requirements of the immigration rules, you would suffer a disproportionate breach of your Article 8 rights if you were deported. And I think this is the last bit for now. Um, appealing the decision to deport you. There is no longer an automatic right to appeal a decision to, uh, to, to deport you. You may have grounds, however, for a claim that does not have the right to, of appeal if refused. A human rights based on Article 8 family life in the UK, for example, can probably um, qualify. Generally, there is no legal aid available if you have the right to appeal while in the UK unless the appeal is based on refugee grounds or Article 3 human rights grounds. So, um, they do have something called asylum or human rights claim. I just read that one paragraph. If at the time of a decision to deport you, there are asylum or human rights grounds that mean you need to stay in the UK and you have not already informed the Home Office of these or made an application, you may need to do so now. So, I hope you found that useful. You may have to listen to it a couple of times and read the notes. But yeah, like I said, I've taken it from um, Right to Remain, which is a website that provides a toolkit of everything you know need to know about staying in the country, um, your legal rights, who to speak to, whether or not how to get in touch with your MP. And there's a host of information. I was flabbergasted. So I was quite pleased to come across that. And that's all for now. I must go off to sleep. Good night.